Queen and the Night Comes Down. And this is, I'm playing it right now in front of Roger Taylor, who's listening in our studio on the speakers. How did that feel to you? Ah, well, it uh, took me back and uh, I thought it sounded quite good. Uh, I I think we were playing well at that that point. This was one of your first singles, wasn't it? When you were unsigned, you recorded this initially. Um, This was never a single, actually. Oh, was it not? I think that was the idea. It was going to be the third and there was never a third, so... So yeah, it's sort of been reborn. OK, so this is on Queen One, which is a... And I'm going to re- read this so I get all the words in the right order. Um, Queen One, a remixed, remastered and expanded version of Queen's self-titled 1973 debut album. Um, that's yeah. right. And I've got it in front of me right now and it's a beautiful thing. The box set is absolutely beautiful. Tell oh. us tell us all about this because it's a labour sure. of love, I think, isn't it, between you and Brian, Brian yeah, May? very much so. Um when we first recorded this back in the mists of time, um, we were in Trident Studios, which was the studio at the moment. You know, Bowie just was doing, uh, we had just finished uh, Hunky Dory and uh, Z- Ziggy Stardust, and, and they were all done in one session. Um, and they're two fantastic albums. And so we were very pleased that our management uh, actually owned the studio. And we, were, we used to take all the downtime and uh, but unfortunately, they, they used to record things in a very dry way, and we didn't really want that sound. So the sound that we got there was never really what we wanted. So what we've tried to do is uh, take these this album, which we've renamed Queen One, to make it clear that it's the first one, the beginning. It was actually called Queen at the time, yeah, and um, and really just made it sound more the way we wanted it to sound. And they were recorded when they in the night time. You didn't necessarily have the daytime, the luxury of doing it in daytime. No, no. We had to, you know, Lou Reed would pack up and we'd go we we'd go in when he was going to bed. Really? But yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we uh, we'd go leave the studio when the cleaners came in. <laughs> did you leave it tidy or was it yeah, did, was there a lot of cleaning well, up to I do? Hope not, no. <laughs> <laughs> what were you like at that time? Describe what it was like being in Queen at that. <laughs> oh, but we were like a very tight knit gang. It was like for me, being in a band has always been like being in a gang. And you feel very, you know, you're living in each other's pockets and, it's, you know, you share life together. And um, we had a sort of a vision, especially the three of us, uh, Freddie, Brian and myself. Uh, John came along later. And um, I think, you know, uh, I can't believe we never split up, uh, as many people seem to do. Mm. Um we just kept going and uh, you have to have faith and it's really everything else becomes kind of secondary mm. and then obviously, you know, you, you get older, you have kids and stuff. They become important but the band is still very, very important and central. We used to call it the mothership. The band were the mothership. Yeah. What, what was that vision that you had? Well, <laughs> it's very simple. Uh, as Freddie would have said, we want to make it to the top, the top tip of the top of most dears. And uh, that was it. We were very ambitious. Um, I think we, we were strong musically. Um, and we, I, I suppose we wanted to do a lot of things, which was why we were eclectic and there were a lot of different styles on our, our various albums. Yeah, And you say you never split up. What do you put that down to? How did you never split up when... The majority of bands do at some point. <laughs> they go their separate ways. There are only a few that kind of last the distance. They do, or they fracture, and uh, new people come in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It always seemed completely daft to me. Um, if you have a vision and you have a sort of, an, a, you, you find an allegiance to your gang, you know, and, and come on, we're going to do this together. And, and there's a great feeling of togetherness. And I think for that to be spoiled or broken out it just seems daft and you know so many bands have one hit two hits and then the egos get out of control and, and for whatever reason somebody has to leave because they feel they're more important than the rest and um and that never they, happened yeah they break up and they spiral downwards you know into obscurity usually Mm. But there was no one in the band who thought they were better than the others. That's probably uh, the bottom line, isn't oh, it? I'm not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you all think yeah, you were better? Yeah, yeah. yeah, we were all... No, we didn't. I, I, I don't know. Um, Maybe you made way and you worked around each other's yeah, egos and yeah, kind of self-importance. Yeah. I know it would appear from the outside that Freddie must have had the, 
the biggest ego, but that's just not true, actually. Mm. Yeah. No, he was the front man, wasn't he? That was it. He was the front man, exactly. That was his job, and, and God, he was good at it. He was very, very yeah. good at it, yeah. yeah. And so when you did ha- hit the, the bumps in the road, when you did hit those moments, how, how did you navigate around that? How did you, um, did you give each other space? Did you? There must have been times yeah. when you didn't speak to each other because you were just getting on each other's nerves. Yeah, we had hissy fits and didn't speak to one another for a while, but... You know, you you just got to be a little bit bigger than that, I think, and uh, and get over it and uh, resolve. Yeah. Is there anyone who was who was the peacemaker in the band? Was there anyone who used to go? Okay. More than anybody, Freddie. Was it really? He was the peacemaker. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. 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 And did you socialise a lot? I presume you did, as well as being in the studio. Oh, very much so. Um, Especially in the early days. I mean, Freddie and I had the, a stall in Kensington Market and, you know, we lived in the same um, flat and et cetera. Yeah, we sort of shared our lives and shared our girlfriends, Tell us et cetera. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> yeah. Tell yeah. us about the stall that you had in Kensington Market. Well, yeah, we had a little stall that I, I spent my student grant on the, on the rent and uh, we used to sell artwork from... Uh, art colleges, uh, because Ferry was at art college. Uh, um, and then we sort of got into the rag trade. And when I say rags, they really were. Um, we, we used to sell old Edwardian silk scarves and and then we actually started having velvet things made. But we weren't very good at the rag trade. No. But, but I presume being there, you were surrounded, being in London as well, you were surrounded yeah. by like-minded creative people. People who were arty, arty, artistic, well, artistic or not? Well, sort of, yeah. It was semi-boho and semi-sort of, I mean, people selling clothes in the in the markets were, were into the money, really, you know, trying to make a few quid. Um, it, but it was a nice scene we were in, in, in that Kensington, Chelsea scene. It was it was very sort of, we used to dress pretty outrageously and, and get away with it. And yeah, it was... A fun was, place to it, be. It was a really good, it was a meeting point, yeah. Uh, sort of a hub. Yeah. yeah, where you meet your people, I guess. But then that would yeah. also have happened in the studios, when you were in studios, that you met various other people who were making music like various you. Various other people, or sometimes being in the studio was quite lonely. You know, because there might be just your lot, and, and uh, but we did meet a lot of people. We, you know, had <laughs> times with the Sex Pistols. I remember. Oh my gosh! That was, yeah, fascinating, actually, fascinating times. Oh no, tell me more about that. It was great, actually. We were sort of. I think they thought we were sort of some kind of um, spoilt dinosaurs or something. I don't know. And uh, they actually, they were they were quite good. I, I wasn't very keen on Sid, but. Um, yeah, Johnny was very interesting. Uh, he, yeah, how many? Very he... different, you know. And it was a nice shot in our arm, actually, to to see what was happening. Yeah. Where, t- tell me when this happened and where you met them. Oh, that was much later. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we were, you know, we'd sort of happened before that. Uh, I guess that was 76 and 77. I remember the day Chris Thomas, the great producer, uh, walked in to the studio because there were two studios, and literally turned their record into this fantastic record that they came out with, never mind the bollocks. And um, he just, without him, you know, it would not have been a very good record. Eh? Mm. And it was a sensational record. Yeah. yeah. John Lydon's a fascinating person. I mean, quite, yeah. yeah I mean, obviously yeah. a very, very outspoken, but a really interesting person to have a conversation with. Yeah, no, I, I, I found him, yeah, funny and, and yeah, yeah. Okay, let's play a record and we'll come back and talk some more to sure. Roger Taylor. So it's an evening in with Roger Taylor we're doing at the moment. Um, we asked you for a song to dance to, so a song that gets you, that makes you dance, that makes your limbs move, and you went for an Underworld track. Tell me about this. I just love this this track. Um, I'm quite ignorant about a lot of stuff that goes on now, you know. Uh, but I always liked, I mean, this is ages ago anyway, and that, that, that track, it was just the sheer abandon of it. And it's, it sounds great, and I love the repetition of the lager lager and the drums, and I just like the track, you know. Mm-hmm. 